Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be starting our series on the book of Acts, where I'm entitling this section, The Beginnings, uh, Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 12. We begin the book, the first account I composed Theophilus, and notice um, how, how Luke, the writer, uh, is writing to Theophilus just as he addressed the Gospel of Luke. Uh, back then it was to most excellent Theophilus. Uh, here the honorific, most excellent, is left off. So it's just Theophilus. Uh, I like to think that that's maybe because Theophilus by now has become a Christian. And so instead of most excellent Theophilus, he's now Brother Theophilus. Uh, so that first account was a reference to the Gospel of Luke. Um, and it dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven after he had, by the Holy Spirit, given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. And what Luke has just done, he has encapsulated, encapsulated in one single verse <laughs> the entire Gospel of Luke. That This is a very a short rehashing of the Gospel of Luke. So back in Luke chapter 24, and I notice, I want you to see what's happening, and I'm borrowing this from uh, Craig uh, Keener's uh, excellent commentary on, on Acts. Uh, he came up with this, this chart. Um, in Luke 24, at the, uh, after the resurrection, you have Jesus appearing on multiple occasions. Uh, here we're going to see that Jesus uh, comes and presents many convincing proofs here in Acts chapter 1. In Luke 24, there's no time element mentioned. Here in Acts 1, uh, we're told that it's a period of 40 days. Uh, Luke uh, chapter 24, uh, we see the, the instructions of Jesus, stay in Jerusalem, and that's going to be repeated here, where Jesus says, don't leave Jerusalem. Uh, in Luke, uh, he says, stay in the city until you are clothed with power. Here he's going to say, wait for what the Father promised, and he's going to explain how, how the power from God is going to come. In Luke, he had ended, uh, we're hoping, remember, uh, this is uh, on the Emmaus Road, where uh, two of the disciples had said, uh, we were hoping it was he who were going who was going to redeem Israel, as they're explaining to Jesus, not recognizing him. Uh, here in Acts chapter 1, they're going to ask the question, Lord, is it this time you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? So notice that Israel kingdom uh, redeeming theme is seen in both. And uh, finally, Jesus says, uh, you are witnesses of these things. And uh, he's going to say in verse 8, you shall be my witnesses. And at the end of Luke, the very last thing in Luke chapter 24, Jesus ascends into heaven. And that's going to happen here again where Jesus ascends into heaven. So I want you to see, uh, it's not that where it picks up in, in the very next second, but actually it, it takes and retells a bit of that story using new descriptions and new language, but it's a, a retelling. It's a little bit like when you see a movie and then there's a sequel, but the sequel doesn't start off right when the previous movie left off. It actually picks up with a little bit of the action right at the end so that you are reminded of where you were in the story, and that's taking place here. So verse 3, to these he also presented himself alive, this is Jesus, after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days. Now, that's going to be significant, notice, and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Over a period of 40 days. We've seen that number in the past um, having having significance. It rained for 40 days in, uh, in the flood. Uh, Moses was 40 days on Mount Sinai receiving the law. The, the spies were in Canaan for 40 days. Goliath <laughs> issues his challenge for 40 days. And Jonah gave the city of Nineveh 40 days to repent. Remember, uh, 40 days from now, Nineveh is going to be destroyed. Uh, and of course, they repent. And, and in each of these cases, there is perhaps... There is perhaps this idea of a testing. Now, I'm not sure if that's the case here in Jesus' day, um, where was it a period of testing? Um, but maybe it was preparing them for the upcoming test because he's with them now, but he's not going to be with them, at least in, in the body, and, and he's not physically going to be with them. He's going to ascend into, into heaven, and then their test will begin which is the test that we all face, the test of, of having Jesus with us, yes, in spirit, but not, not physically with us. And that's the test 
before us that we're going to face in the book of Acts. Well, verse 4, gathering them together, and, and that phrase, gathering them together, the Greek word, uh, sunali zomenos. Um, it's a figure of speech. It literally means gathering together. That's, it's not a bad translation. But it's a, a bit of a figure of speech. You know how sometimes you'll say something, uh, and it doesn't mean that literally, um, if I say it's raining cats and dogs. That doesn't mean literally that dogs and cats are falling down from the sky. Oh, let me go out and grab a kitten. No, uh, it's a figure of speech meaning it's raining really hard. Uh, or if I say uh, two people are, well, uh, two people are sleeping together. That doesn't mean they're just taking a nap. They're maybe engaged. It, it, it sort of assumes they're engaged in some sort of uh, physical uh, sexual activity. The, the same thing here, gathering them together is a figure of speech, meaning uh, it means normally that they're eating together. And so this perhaps is a meal that they, they have together. Uh, and he commanded them as he as he uh, comes brings them together. He commands them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised. So it's it's almost one of those hurry up and waits um, because because there's something coming, but it's not time quite yet. But it but it will be to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, "You heard from me." For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now, notice that reference to being baptized with the Holy Spirit. And, of course, we we get from the context, when we get to Acts chapter 2, we're going to see um, a reference where the Holy Spirit shows up, and we're going to read about how they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And you say, well, is being baptized with the Holy Spirit the same thing as being filled with? with the Holy Spirit. And, and I would say, well, it's, it's the same Holy Spirit, um, maybe two sides of the same coin. Uh, I don't think they're quite the same. But notice there's not here a clear distinction between those. And so uh, there's times where um, if you want to be very specific, you can uh, go to the epistles, and I think you can see places where Paul, uh, for example, does use the terms uh, a bit differently. Uh, when you're being filled with something, that, that in, the, in this case is the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is coming into you. When you're being baptized with the Holy Spirit, there's a sense in which you're going into the Spirit. Uh, so, like I said, two sides, I think, of the same coin. Verse 6, and so when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? Are we there yet? <laughs> They're asking. And their question revolves around the kingdom. Is the kingdom going to come right now? Because they had heard Jesus, and Luke had recorded them hearing Jesus, uh, who had said, that, don't be looking for the kingdom out there. I tell you, the kingdom is right here in your midst. And so there's a sense in which uh, we can talk about the kingdom and that the kingdom already is here. And yet they they they're 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 asking, they're not saying okay, uh, what's you know here's the kingdom. They're actually asking, are you restoring the kingdom of Israel? Their view is that the kingdom is still to come. Well, is the kingdom now, or is the kingdom not yet? And I would suggest that the answer is yes, that it is both now and not yet. And so when they ask him, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He's not going to say yes. He's not going to say no. <laughs> He's going to give a bit of a different answer. Verse 7, he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. You see, you're wanting to, to, to know how it's all going to pan out, uh, when everything's going to happen, and I'm not going to tell you by the way, I think he says that to us as well. You see, we're reading this text, and by the time we get, by the time we read the rest of the New Testament, we are given a few more details, certainly. But I think for us too, it's not for us to know the times of the epochs which the Father has fixed by His own authority. Are we there yet? Well, that's not for you to know. But here's something, and notice the contrast, verse eight. But by contrast. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you'll be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria 
and even to the remotest part of the earth. Now, now notice verse 7 has that negative. It's not for you to know the times of the epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. That's, that's what's not going to be given. But now, positively speaking, here's what is in your domain right now. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and that's what is going to be given. And so back to our our verse, notice you're going to receive power. Now, I've heard all sorts of sermons about the how the word power, the Greek word there is dunamis, and, and that's well and good, and people say, well, that's where we get our word dynamite. But don't necessarily think of that as something that's explosive. It's just this basic word for power or ability works very nicely, too. Uh, in other words, something's going to happen, and then you're going to be empowered. You're going to, to receive an ability from the Holy Spirit once he comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. And I have already suggested that that term witness is the big idea throughout the book of Acts. Now, when you say witness, the first thing that comes to mind, um, I don't know about you, the first thing that comes to my mind is a witness in a legal proceeding. And indeed, the book of Acts is going to take us through a number of legal proceedings as the disciples are arrested and they appear before one court and another court and they go from trial to trial. And I don't mean trials in the in the trials and tribulation sense, but I mean legal trials uh, where, where twice even the case for Christianity will actually come before uh, Roman proconsuls. Uh, but before that, we'll see it coming before Jewish authorities and then eventually Gentile authorities and all sorts of authorities, as in each case, the disciples will give testimony. They will give witness. And of course, a witness, if he's a, if he's a good one, he's an eyewitness. They will give eyewitness testimony that they saw a dead man get up and walk. You shall be my witnesses. They're going to be testifying of what they saw Jesus do, that he had died, that he had risen from the dead, and in a moment we're going to see, and has ascended into heaven. And notice, it's going to be both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. Here they were in Jerusalem, but it wasn't to remain there. It would be the surround, the, the district in which Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem is Judea, that's the district. And then the next district to the north would be Samaria, even to the remotest part of the earth. And that's going to be the movement of the book of Acts, which is going to start here in Jerusalem. And by the time we're done, we're going to make it all the way to the city of Rome. Notice, even to the remotest part of the earth. Uh, I like the Greek text better. Uh, this um, the the Greek literally says the uh, askatu uh, tain gais, uh, even to the end of the earth. And you say, well, end of the earth, does that mean they thought the end was going to end? Uh, no, but that's the term that's used. Again, it's a figure of speech. And it's a familiar figure of speech, both in the Old Testament, and we're going to see it quoted later on in the book of Acts, one place where we see it, Isaiah chapter 49 and verse 6, where he says, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant, this is God speaking, to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also make you a light to the nations. Think, remember that idea of a witness. (laughs) I will make you a light to the nations so that my salvation may reach, and here it is, to the end of the earth. Now, what's interesting is that this same passage is quoted, that that last section, I will make you uh, a light to the nations so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. When we get to Acts chapter 13 and verse 47, um, Paul's going to be quoting this passage, which means that as Luke uses the phrase here, putting it into into the mouth of Jesus, I think he's got this passage in mind. Because, like I said, he's going to quote extensively from it when we get halfway through the book of Acts. Be that as it may, verse 9, And after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Now, when you think of the cloud, remember uh, in the Old Testament, there was that that glory cloud. Uh, but even before that, in, in the um, in the ministry of Jesus, you had had a cloud 
where at the transfiguration, the disciples saw two men, uh, Moses and Elijah. Remember, uh, three of the disciples had been there, uh, Peter and James and John. But we're going to see also two men show up in, in white clothing in, in just a minute. Um, now, uh, the two men had been Moses and Elijah at the transfiguration. Uh, we're not to- told who the two men are here. Uh, I think, I suspect they are angels, but we're not told that. that we're just told two men. Um, in the transfiguration, when it was over, only Jesus and the disciples remained, the, the two men, they were gone. When the ascension is over, <laughs> the two men and the disciples will remain, but Jesus will have been gone from their sight. And so, verse 10, as they were gazing intently into the sky, he, as he was, while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood, bef- uh, stood beside them. They also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. Now, notice again the two men. Like I said, I think they are angels. We're not told that in particular. Perhaps we're not told that just so we can remember the two men that also showed up in the case of the transfiguration. But also remember, you have also remember back in Luke chapter uh, 24, where you had two men at the resurrection. Uh, as the women came to the tomb and they found the stone rolled away, they saw two men in dazzling apparel. Here, the two men are in white clothing. Uh, in both cases, again, I think I think they are angels, although they're not. Uh, we're not. They're not called that in these two passages. Um, in Luke twenty-four, they ask, "Why do you seek the living one among the dead?" They ask the question. Here, the question is, "Why do you stand looking?" into the sky. In Luke, um, they, had, they had reported he is not here, but he is risen. Here in Acts, they say this Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come. So one points to the resurrection, one points not just to the ascension, but also that he will come again. And so uh, we close this section w- really with a promise of the eventual return of, of Jesus, that he will return, notice, in the same way he was taken up. And of course, at the end of the story, remember how the, the woman, after they finish uh, seeing uh, this and receiving this report, they return from the tomb and reported all these things. Uh, likewise, as, as we come to verse 12, we're going to read that they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet. Now, notice when they are returning, this is where you find out where this took place, where the ascension took place. Um, Apparently, it took place from this mount, which is called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem. Notice a Sabbath day's journey. Um, Actually standing in Jerusalem as I took this picture, looking out across the Kidron Valley. And uh, to the east, you can see uh, what we call the Mount of Olives, the, the mount called Olivet. And there is a prophecy in Zechariah chapter 14, about how the Lord will come and his foot shall stand on the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives isn't mentioned that many times in the Old Testament. But that's one of the times, and it goes on to say, and the mountain will split in two, and the past goes on to to say a lot of things that are going to take place then. Um, and, And I like to think that that what's being described there is the same thing that we've just read about, that that the Lord's going to come in just as you saw him. I, I, I take that to mean in the same way. Maybe, maybe even to the same place, to this, uh, maybe this will be sort of the, the touchdown place where the Lord himself returns. And so from the Mount of Olives, they come back to Jerusalem, and we'll pick up next time uh, what happens next. But Jesus has ascended into heaven. We will see him again in the book of Acts. But when we see him, he will be at the right hand of the Father on high.